Think about your life. Every day you wake up and fight to live in freedom and against fear. But Christ has already won the battle for our freedom. We didn't earn it. The battle was won when Jesus died on the cross. We don't deserve it. He gives us grace because of his great love for us. And our freedom was secured when Christ rose from the dead. The grace of God gives us freedom. Freedom from sin, freedom to live the life he calls us to. We aren't saved by trying harder. We aren't saved by trying to be good. Only Jesus can save us and set us free. So enjoy God's gift of grace in your life. Be at peace and live in freedom. I'm so glad that you're here today. Thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Pastor Libin Abraham is on his way to India. He is going to be a special guest speaker at a Christian conference in India. And it's a great opportunity to really teach the Word of God to a whole group of people that he would not be able to touch otherwise. And I'm going to ask you to be remembering him in prayer and pray for him this week, especially on Tuesday and Wednesday as he is teaching in three different sessions. Be in prayer for him and for his safe travel. Be praying that God would use him to bless those that are there, that God would use this conference to bless him, to bless Liban, and that God and his kingdom would be honored in the midst of it. All of us go through disappointments. All of us experience bumps and bruises in life. And from time to time, all of us experience deep wounds. Every one of us in this room, all of us, are flawed. But if we ever let the disappointments that we experience in our life, or the deep wounds, or the flaws of our life to define us, we've made a horrible decision. No matter where you are in your life right now, no matter where you are, God can make you an overcomer through the power of the Holy Spirit in you. And this is what Paul is really saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8 when he says this, we are hard-pressed on every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. When I read this verse, there is a, an analogy, a football analogy for me of a quarterback. And there he is, and he ha- the ball has been snapped, and he has it in his hands. And, but now he is experiencing a blitz, a blitz from every direction. Now, for those of you who are not football people, there are a certain number of people at the snap of the ball that come after the quarterback, but on a blitz It feels like, at least, not everybody comes, but it feels like everybody's coming. And they are rushing this quarterback, and no matter where he turns, to the right or the left, they are coming after him, and he cannot get away from them. They are coming. They're closing in on him to crush him. And maybe that's how you're feeling financially or emotionally or spiritually or relationally or morally. That no matter where you turn, they are coming in to crush you. And Paul is saying in this verse, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8, he is saying this, I refuse to allow the hard times I'm going through to define me. I refuse to lose heart. We're in the book of Galatians, going through the book of Galatians together. I'm loving the book, and we're going through this book of Galatians together in a series entitled, How to Live in Freedom. And we've arrived at Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. In Galatians 5, verse 7, Paul says, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you? Who kept you from obeying the truth? You were going in the right direction. You were doing the right things. Now what's happened? 
What has happened to you? Stay in the race. Get back in the race. Stay in the race. And that is what I want to talk to you about today. Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 to 14, has an overarching theme. It was the same in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and chapter 4. Paul is so adamant about correcting some individuals called Galatians, and he just keeps coming after it and hammering it over and over and over again. But we've been faithful to that over-abiding theme. And so this morning, I want to walk past that, and I want us to take a couple of themes that Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture that, that we have not addressed, that Paul hasn't addressed before now. And the first one is simply this. Christ has set us free to have a relationship with God. Notice how he puts it in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. So Christ has truly set us free. It is Christ that sets you free. It is not you. It is not you that sets you free. Every man-made religion in the world has one big idea, and that is you save yourself by your performance, by the good things you do. If you do enough good things, you go to heaven. If you don't do enough good things, you go to hell. You save yourself. Only problem is with these man-made religions is that these religions never tell you when you have made it. With them, you never know if you've been good enough in order to get to heaven. And so all you're left with is crossing your fingers. I sure hope it all turns out well. And that is all they leave you with. These man-made religions also say that you can't have a relationship with God. God is too far out there. He is too other And you can't ever have a personal relationship with God. But Jesus says exactly the opposite. All of them agree, but Jesus says all of them are wrong. Jesus taught us that God wants to be our heavenly Father. He wants to have this relationship with us. He wants to know us and us to know Him. Jesus said that God, out of His love for us initiated our salvation, that we don't save ourselves. He sent a Savior to save us, the one and only Son of God, Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He came and lived a perfect life, and He died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin for us. He came to do what we couldn't do. And he rose again from the grave, and he offers to us the gift of eternal life. It's a gift. It's a gift. And he says, if by faith you would accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, he will come in and save you and forgive you and cleanse you and reserve a place in heaven for you. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is true. Jesus did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. Christ set us free to have a relationship with God. Free. The word freedom has always been tied to responsibility. Freedom is never really free. Freedom has never meant a license to do whatever we want. Freedom has always meant the power to do what we should. Freedom always requires responsibility. And that is what Paul is saying in Galatians 5.1. Listen to what he says. So Christ has truly set us free. But now make sure that you stay free. And don't get tied up again in slavery to the Old Testament law. What Paul is saying is, don't bring religion of rules and regulations and rituals. Instead, 
have a relationship of love with God. Now, I want to say this, that Judaism is not a man-made religion. God came down to Abraham and spoke to Abraham, and he came to Moses, and he gave to Moses the Mosaic law, and he had that relationship with David and the prophets and all the guys in between, guys and gals in between. But that law that he gave to Moses was a bridge between Abraham and the Messiah. It was to bridge the gap between Abraham and the Messiah. And even the Old Testament prophets said, we have this law, but there is a day coming when the Messiah comes that he will put this law into our hearts, that there will be a power that comes to live inside of our hearts, the Holy Spirit of God. The prophets even told about this event that would come. And when Jesus came, he completed the law. He fulfilled the law. And now, it is not the law that we live by. It is faith in Jesus Christ. The Old Testament law was an outside pressure. But the grace that comes by faith in Jesus Christ is an internal power. And God has called you and I to live by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and nothing else we do in relationship with God. It's the first thing that Paul mentions in this passage. But there is a second truth Paul mentions in the passage. And it says, everything God wants us to do is wrapped up in the word love. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, but instead use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, where did Paul get this? Where did Paul get the idea to love your neighbor as yourself? And where did Paul get the idea that all of the law is summarized in the word love? He got it from Jesus. He's simply quoting Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest of all the commandments. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. See, it's the same terms, all the law. The same things that Jesus is saying in this passage, Paul is saying in Galatians. But Jesus then adds another idea, and it is this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So in everything, do to others what you want them to do to you. For this sums up all the law and the prophets. Here Jesus uses two things. To love your neighbors yourself and to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Both of these are connected to, and this hangs all of the law and the prophets. So here is the idea. To love your neighbor as yourself really means to do unto others as you would have them do to you. Now, he didn't say do unto others like they do to you. He said do unto others like you want them. You want them to do to you. And it's brilliant. And I'm going to tell you why. Because every last one of us in this room know what we want other people to do to us. All of us know how we want to be treated by other people. We all know it. Every last one of us know exactly when someone treats us in a way we don't want. We immediately know, I don't like that. We know how we want other people to treat us. And Jesus is saying, since you know this so well, do this same thing to others. 
So in a practical sense, what is he telling us? Well, first of all, all of us want others to give us the benefit of the doubt. Don't harshly judge me. Don't just judge me on a little sliver. Judge me on the whole. Give me the benefit of the doubt, for crying out loud. Think the best of me instead of the worst of me. And so listen to how Jesus puts it. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you again. So what, what, think about this. Is it possible that other people are negatively judging you? And if they are, is it possible that it's payback for how negatively you judged? No, that's not possible for any of us. But for people out there, probably it is. But listen to what he says. In the same measure you use to judge others, it will be used for you. And notice then what he says. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank? Do you see this little piece of dust and a plank sticking out of your eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. All of us in this room want people to give us the benefit of the doubt. None of us in this room want people to negatively judge us. We want them to judge us as a whole, not just one little piece. And every one of us want people to think the best about us instead of the worst. And Jesus is saying, well, if this is what you want, then this is what you should dish out. Do unto others as you want them to do to you. The second one is all of us in this room want others to forgive us when we've hurt them. Have you ever hurt somebody? Every one of us have. Have we ever been hurt by somebody else? Every one of us have. You you can't be around other people for very long without somebody bumping somebody. It's just part of life. It's just human nature. And so there have been times in which you have been hurt by others. There are people that you have hurt. And so when you've hurt others, what do you want them to do? You want them to forgive you. The Bible says in Ephesians 4.32, Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You want others to forgive you. And Jesus says, that makes total sense. Then, if you want others to forgive you, you forgive others. Stop holding these bitternesses. Stop holding this constant resentment and anger. And you talk about it every day and you're all upset about someone. As soon as you see their face, you just, all of it comes back up again. Give it up. Be willing to forgive. You want others to forgive you? Be willing to forgive others. All of us want others to come to our rescue when we are in need and So, do unto others as you want them to do to you. Sometimes, isn't it true that our schedule is so busy that all we can see is us? All we can see is our schedule. All we can see is, i got to get this done and this done and this done and this. And we are totally blind to the needs of rescue of other people around us. And Jesus is saying, you would want someone else to open their eyes and see you when you need to be rescued. Open your eyes. And when you see someone in need, go out, reach out, and rescue. It's not somebody else's problem. You rescue others because you would want others to rescue you. And here's the fourth one. All of us want others to treat us with respect. If there is anything I've heard over and over and over again is, please, would you just respect me for who I am? Would you stop stereotyping me? Would you stop looking at my nationality of origin or my ethnicity or the shade of my skin? Would you stop doing this? 
And would you just respect me for who I am? And all of us want this. So, then we should do that to others in our life. You see, these are the principles that Jesus had in mind when he said, do unto others as you want them to do to you. And so this applies to bosses in how they handle their employees. This applies to employees for how they respond to their bosses and employees for how they respond to each other and family members and neighbors and friends and classmates and all these people that are around the circles of our life. It applies to all of us, and there are some times we blow it. There are some times we mess up. There are some times we do what is wrong. And when we do, we own up and we ask forgiveness. And we get started again. All this means that no matter what you face, no matter what happens, no matter what challenges you encounter, We swallow our pride, and we treat that person the way we would want to be treated. Now, this is pretty easy if you think about it with people that are around us, our family members and our friends and and that kind of thing. But when when you come across a mean, no good man... Our woman, you have no idea, Pastor, what I have to deal with in my life with people that I am around. I'm telling you, there are mean people out there, and I keep running into them. Now, I know this cannot possibly apply to those people because they don't deserve it. Well, notice what Jesus said about those people. He said in Luke chapter 6, but I tell you who, love, who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Stop for a moment. As I've been reading these words, did you have any pictures of individuals come to your mind? Do not call their name out. Don't say, don't say who it is. But okay. So what we know is when we were hearing this passage and he was talking about our enemies and people are so mean and hate us and cuss us and all this, we know who, we know who this is. We know who this is. And now, listen to what he says. Do unto others as you'd have them do to you. Uh, He repeats this in this passage. What he's saying is, do unto others as you'd have them do to you is not just for the good people. It's for the no good people in our lives. It's for them too. Notice what he says. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even unbelievers love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even unbelievers do that. I mean, you don't have to even know God or have any interest in God to be nice to people who are nice to you. It it doesn't take God to do that. That's what he's saying. But it takes God When you find an enemy, when you find someone who mistreats you, when you find someone that cusses you out, person who is mean to you, now it takes God for verse 35, but love your enemies and do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Circle the word lend. Last night, it just came to me. I was looking over this passage, and I have all my life, when I have read this passage and I've come across Lend, I've always thought of Lend as being money. When you lend money to somebody, well, I'm not lending money to anybody, so uh, it doesn't apply to me. But look, what if it's not meant to be just money? What if it's meant when you lend kindness to somebody else? When you lend being 
nice to someone else, and they don't return kindness to you. And they don't return nice. I've been nice to this person, and all they give me back is grief. Oh, I'm not doing it anymore. No, this is what he said. When you lend to them, do it without expecting to get anything back. And guess what? Then your reward will be great. And you will be the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. Because He, meaning God, because He is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. So, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Don't you just hate this passage? Don't you? I wish it wasn't. It's, it's in the Bible, isn't it? I wish it wasn't in the Bible. But it's right there. And here's what he's saying. When you are kind to people who are not kind back, and you keep being kind, and you keep being good, guess what? Great will be your reward in heaven. And every one of us want to have great reward in heaven. And it will be great in heaven. And I want to tell you why. Because you are acting like a child of the Most High God when you do that. You're being like Jesus. I got to tell you, to do this, we cannot do this on our own power. And that is the next point. To live by love will require, this kind of love will require God's power to love through you. And this is the coolest idea. And I need you to really stay with me through it. Galatians chapter 5 verse 5 says, But we who live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised us. If we will do, we will live by the Spirit, we will get back righteousness that will honor God. So here's, here's the concept. You remember, uh, well, it is the Holy Spirit who gives you the, the internal power for right living, and that includes loving others who treat you so wrong. You remember when we were in Galatians chapter 3 that we saw that when we come to know Jesus as our Savior, that the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. This is the question that Paul asked in Galatians 3, 2. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? And he is asking a question that the answer is, so, is already obvious. We didn't get the Holy Spirit by observing a list of rules and regulations and rituals. The Holy Spirit came to live inside of us when we accepted Jesus Christ by faith. And that everybody that read this in Galatia, okay, yeah, I know what the answer is. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So here's what he's saying. If you don't have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you're not a Christian. That's what he's saying. You don't have the Holy Spirit living inside you, you're not a Christian. But the reverse statement is exactly true as well. If you have accepted Christ as Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living inside you. He uses the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ. They're just different words for the Holy Spirit that Paul uses throughout his writings. I've set it up. I've laid the foundation about the Holy Spirit because of the next verse. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. This is the verse that took me by such surprise. God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. A few decades ago, I was in a quiet time, and I came. I was going through Romans chapter 5, and I came to verse 5, and it's like, you know those times in which you are studying the Bible, and all of a sudden there is this verse, and it just grabs up, gra jumps up out of the page and grabs you by the throat and says, you're not leaving here. I want to talk to you. And this verse was one of those verses for me in my quiet time, and I just stopped, and I began to learn something that I had never understood before. 
The verse is actually saying when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, God pours his love into your heart. And as I was studying this, and I, I wrote this sentence, and the sentence is in your notes, this means that I never have to pray for more love. Oh God, I am, you cannot believe the mean person I'm trying to deal with now. And God, I need more love. I never have to pray that prayer. You never have to pray that prayer, ever. Why? Because when the Holy Spirit came to live inside of you, God poured His love into your heart. So now, all you have to do is release this love of God that has now become resident in you. The problem is not a lack of love. The problem is self-will that stands in front of the flow. I will not love that person. That person should not be loved. But God is saying, if you'll step to the side, I have all this love resident in your heart, and I will love this person and I will use you as a conduit to show this person love, if you'd be willing. You're getting the idea? So why is it that this all happened to me at this moment? Because I had a guy that was just mean. He was just mean. His name is Lee, and he was mean. And I didn't like him, okay? He was rude, he was unkind, and I didn't like him. And now God is saying to me, Mark, but I love him. And I thought about it and I said, I don't know why. I I don't know why anyone, anyone would, but I love him. And Mark... I want, I got all this love I poured into you when the Holy Spirit came into you, when you accepted Jesus as your Savior, and I want to love Him through you. Uh, So here's what I said. Okay. Okay. I want to not disobey you. I, I will step aside and I will let you be kind and loving to him through me. But I want you to know, all the time it's happening, I'm not feeling it. I'm just being honest with you. As I'm just being honest. I'm a pastor, but I am a human being. And I'm just being honest with you. And I just said, I'm not going to feel it. but I am willing. So I said, when we're, I'm around this guy, if you'll put thoughts in my mind about nice things to say and do and kind things, I will do them. But I'm not feeling it. So I did. And I will tell you, starting the next day, every time I was around this guy, I just kept having this flood of things to be nice about with him and do kind things to him and say positive things about him. And you know what? The craziest thing that happened, at over time, he didn't respond immediately, but over time, God began softening his heart. He started being kind to me. He started being nice to me. And even more amazing... I kept being kind to him and nice to him, and I started feeling it. I'm thinking I actually like this guy now. And we became friends. I'm telling you, it was a shocker of shockers. We became friends. And I'm going to tell you, I really learned something. And so what happened with that is that every time I 
I ran into a knucklehead, another person. You understand that there are mean people out there. Do you know that? Now, there are not any mean people in here, not at Sugar Creek. And you know why? Because every person at Sugar Creek is sweet. It, after all, it is Sugar Creek. <laughs> but I'm telling you, there's some bad people out there. There's some bad people out there. And here's what, every time I kept running into one of these people, God would take me back. Do you remember what happened to Lee? I'm going to ask you to step to the side, please, and I'm going to love this person through you as a conduit. And did you know that many of the people that this happened to, they never got sweet. They never returned it. They never were nice back. Never. But blessed is the person who lends goodness and kindness and not be repaid because great is your reward in heaven. So this is why you don't say, well, okay, they didn't respond, so I'm not doing this anymore. You keep doing it because great is your reward in heaven. You are being like a son or a daughter of God. And then the coolest thing happened to me. It wasn't just true about love. It was true about joy. Joy came to live in me. And peace came to live in me. And patience came to to live in me. Now, I'm going to tell you, you got to step to the side a whole lot with patience, and you've got to say, God, would you be patient through me to that person because I don't really want to. You know what I'm saying? But if you will step to the side and say, God, I am willing for you to be patient through me even though I don't feel it. Goodness, kindness, self-control, why? Because these are all Parts of the fruit of the Spirit that has come to dwell in you, in you when the Holy Spirit came to dwell in you. And when we are willing, when we don't want to do what is the right thing, and we are willing to step to the side and say, God, go ahead and do this, be this, in through me as a conduit, what happens is, is that we begin to grow and our life changes more and more to be like Jesus Christ. And that is what Galatians 5 verse 5 is saying. We who live by the Spirit and not by our own self-will, we get out of the way. God, you can go ahead and do this through me. We that live by the Spirit eagerly wait to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised to us. He begins to change us from the inside out. And this is God's plan for you and me. So here's my question. What do you choose? You're going to live by rules and regulations and rituals. Or are you going to live by the power of the Holy Spirit in relationship with a living God? Which one do you choose? I'm telling you, you can be an overcomer no matter what you're facing. And I'm challenging you. Get back in the race. Stay in the race all the way to the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the life change that it will bring in us if we will just open our heart and let you live through us. You've given us the Holy Spirit. You have poured your love and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and self you've, you've poured all that into us. And now, Father, we ask, would you teach us how to step to the side and let you live your life through us, and all the while changing us to become like Jesus. Now, Father, I pray you'd move in the hearts of many in this room that do not know Christ as Savior, that this would be the day of salvation, that this would be the day they say yes to Jesus Christ. And, Father, for those who know Jesus as Savior, to be willing to step to the side and let you live your life through them. And Father, I pray for those who are visiting our church and there's a sense in their heart, this place feels like home. I want to be a member of this church. Move in their hearts as well, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.